Welcome everybody to the 17th Financing Philadelphia's Future with Congress member, excuse me, council member, Derek Green. Slow down. <laughs> I'm promoting, I'm promoting you, Derek. Um, so I'm Susan Windle. I am chair of the Philadelphia Public Banking Coalition, and we have been working alongside council member Green low these many months, I can't even count them. Um, but here we are, uh, and, and let me just say, there are the instructions, you can read them. Speaker view works good, enter your questions in the chat, let us know which section of the city you're from. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to uh, be on our email list, this is very important, enter your email in the chat so we can keep you posted as things develop. So here we are. Council member, we are uh, have encountered a, a bit of a roadblock or several roadblocks, and I want to give you the opportunity um, to illuminate the public. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, by the way, so hopefully you're all comfortable with that. It'll be up on our on our website and YouTube channel uh, within the next couple of days. So take it away. Let us know. <laughs> well, Susan, it's a pleasure to be here. Um... And I can't believe we've had 17 episodes of Financing Philadelphia's Future. Uh, as I said to our previous host, uh, Vanessa Lowe is not here with us, who I have affectionately called the Oprah Winfrey of public finance. And I will call you the Joan Baez, although you have another poet that you also like, but the Joan Baez of uh, public financing, because you're such a, okay. a great poet. I um, like Joan. <laughs> <laughs> but we are uh, at a session at a impasse right now, uh, although uh, City Council passed 15, one, 15 to 1, uh, the legislation to create the fill up a public financial authority. As we were going through the budget process, uh, and I engaged my council members by sending emails, uh, sending a letter, and also sending a letter to the mayor uh, requesting support, not only for the board appointment, but also for the financing for the fill up a public finance authority. Uh, and send that letter, did not get a response for some time. Uh, eventually in conversations with uh, Council President Clark and other colleagues as we were looking at the state budget, um, Council President, and I want to thank him for doing this, reached out to the administration again. And then I did get a, re a response to my June 3rd letter on June 22nd, um, basically stating that although uh, the administration supported the ideas and concepts that hope to be achieved through the Philadelphia Public Finance Authority. I felt there are other avenues or entities that could do some of these uh, things. Uh, I thought that was unfortunate. Uh, I know others felt that we could have had a conversation with the administration earlier about some of those concerns, but we worked with the administration, uh, at least the law department and the treasurer's office going back to May of last year in drafting this legislation. We went through a lot of iterations got a lot of great legal advice from the law department and worked with the treasurer's office. Uh, as some of the people on this call may remember, we were having meetings twice a week going back to May of last year, both with our outside counsel, Holland and Knight, as well as the law department and the treasurer's office. Uh, and that was the entities that we worked with to draft the legislation um, that was introduced and then passed 15 to one. Uh, so it's unfortunate that we received um, this response from the mayor. Um, we are also looking at additional ways how we can uh, still move forward with this entity. Um, one through uh, the transfer ordinance, which often occurs in the fall of the year, uh, as well as look at other ideas in reference to the board appointments. Uh, it was um, the law department in their review of state law stated that the mayor has to make the appointments to uh, the corporate board of uh, the Philadelphia Public Finance Authority, and that corporate board will then appoint the policy board. Uh, so we, through the Philadelphia Public Banking Coalition, have received um, letters of interest and resumes that want to join um, this board. Uh, and we think that's something that will be beneficial to the city of Philadelphia. Uh, one of the things that Mayor said in his letter were that there are entities like PIDC that can do some of the things that are contemplated by this new entity. Well, the mayor's idea is, is interesting, but as a former 
uh, banker and small business lender. It doesn't make sound lending decisions to have an entity lend and provide guarantees to the same entity. That creates more risk for the entity like a PIDC. Uh, and also that's not part of the business model of traditional lenders, both nonprofit and for-profit lenders. That's why we saw the need to create this entity, the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority, to fill the gap, which provides a void for those small businesses um, that are needed uh, in our city to grow. Um, a statistic that you've heard me say and others have said quite a bit, that in the city of Philadelphia, we have a 43% African-American population and about an 18% uh, Latin population. Um, but only 6% of the businesses with employees are owned by African-Americans. And only 4% of the businesses with employees are owned by um, citizens of Latin, from the Latin diaspora. Uh, and those are the entities that are best credited in creating small businesses and creating jobs are small businesses. And when you think about the challenges that many of these businesses have had coming out of the pandemic, and thinking about the public safety issues we're seeing in our city, especially gun violence. Um, the best way to address gun violence, I believe, is a job. And the best creators of jobs are small businesses. And to help these small businesses to create more jobs, they need programs and they need uh, facilities like credit enhancements and loan guarantees to help them grow, especially as they're dealing with some of the challenging financial issues they've been dealing with coming out of the pandemic. Hmm. Yeah, and one might wonder uh, if we have a, 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 an authority that is responsible for economic development, uh, and as the PIDC has been for lo these many years, um, that they might have done already done something, uh, in, and things have gotten worse. So, well, but I mean, gone. But but, but soon, that's, that's a great point that you raised. Is that you know PIDC, which is a nonprofit. Um, corporation jointly formed by the city and the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce. And they have a lending entity called PIDC Community Capital. But PIDC, just like traditional for-profit lenders, their business model is to lend out money. Uh, they receive deposits like traditional banks, and then they lend the money out at a higher rate of interest. So even a nonprofit entity has certain uh, needs to meet certain type of thresholds. Um, the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority is not looking at trying to uh, make profit. And it's also going in a space that's being unmet right now because that's not the business model for traditional for-profit and non-profit lenders. Uh, so it's really trying to fit a niche, not only for disadvantaged businesses, like I talked about earlier, but also other type of entities like non-profit developers who are trying to address the huge affordable housing issue we have in our city to create more affordable housing units, newer type of industries, like those who are doing things in the green collar industry, uh, like you know, solar and other ideas, which traditionally have been having challenges in getting financing. So it's looking at those areas and then entities like cooperatives. Um, many of the people on this call are familiar with Weaver's Way Co-op in the great section of Mount Airy of Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, those type of entities like cooperatives are not your traditional entity, and they're hard to lend to because you don't have one group of, of owners. You have a large group of lenders, I mean, a large group of owners, excuse me. So when you're trying to lend to entities like a cooperative, who's signing the agreements on behalf of the entity? Is it everybody, all the owners? So, you know, the idea of the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority is really to work in cooperation with community development, financial institutions, credit unions, other entities that do traditional lending and provide a way to fill the gap that's not being met um, to really move things forward and address some of the issues in our city. And can you talk a little bit about the difference between the, the proposed board of the financial authority, the public financial? authority and the PIDC, for instance? Uh, well, the, the now Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation um, is a private nonprofit corporation uh, that was jointly formed by both the city of Philadelphia and the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce. Um, its board appointments come from those, but the city and the chamber. 
Um, and so it has a, a mission to provide lending and other types of services um, to help uh, the city of Philadelphia and the region. Uh, as we were creating the Philadelphia Public Finance Authority, well, we took a, a different approach and also included some of the areas of concerns that um, felt need to be, needed to be addressed. Uh, issues like uh, economic development, affordable housing, some of the environmental issues we talked about and had a much more holistic approach in reference to addressing some of the issues that plague our city in reference to the type of people that would join the board. But I think the, the main difference between those two is that PIDC through its subsidiary uh, PIDC Community Capital is acting like a traditional lender. Its goal is to provide loans. What we're looking to do with the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority is really provide credit enhancements and guarantees to make it easier for those same disadvantaged businesses, those cooperatives, those other hard to lend to entities get access to credit. Uh, if you've listened or heard any of the things we've talked about, not only through um, the 17 other conversations we've had, but if you hear and listen to a lot of different business owners, especially small business owners in the African-American and Latin communities, one of the number one issues that's raised continually is access to credit, access to credit, access to credit. And that's what this entity is trying to do is try to be creative in providing opportunities for access to credit. And we're seeing this idea spread around uh, the country. It's not just here in Philadelphia. Uh, as you all know, who've been on uh, this call in the past, we've had um, Chairman of the Board of Supervisors, uh, Shaman Walton from San Francisco, uh, New York Senator Sanders, uh, looking at doing public banking in New York State. A number of different jurisdictions around um, the country are looking at this idea of public banking, and in other jurisdictions outside the United States, they have had public banking ecosystems for some time at the local, state, and federal level. So if I'm uh, understanding you correctly, you see, um, you do see a path forward in terms of the budget, the road, the budget roadblock, um, that would be this thing you call the transfer ordinance. Um, can you speak a little bit about yeah, so every year, um, generally what happens is that in the fall, there's a transfer ordinance um, that's done through the Appropriations Committee. Um, when we're doing the budget at City Council, we are challenged because under the charter, the mayor controls the revenue estimates. So often we get the revenue estimates of what money is needed prior to us doing the new budget July 1. But for the past number of years, uh, some would say, 15 years, if not more, we actually had actual revenue higher than the estimates. So what ends up happening is that we have additional revenue once we go into the new fiscal year after July 1. And with that additional dollars, we do a transportance, which allows us to appropriate money to different entities that are going to use it. Uh, so one way to find resources for the financing for the operations of this new entity is doing a transfer ordinance, um, which generally happens every fall in October. Uh, that's one way to address the issue of the funding, uh, and we can find different vehicles to address that going around, um, well, unfortunately, going around the administration. Um, but in reference to the board appointment, um, you know, that was a process that we relied on the legal advice of law department based on their review or the administration's review of state law, the mayor has to make board appointments. And we'll look at other strategies of how we move that issue forward. Um, recently, some people have talked about researching what type of litigation um, avenues we may have. Um, this is a, a, a new concept where we'll have to do some research on that to see if that is a vehicle, um, but at least gives us another uh, window to continue to move forward with this idea to benefit citizens in the city of Philadelphia. So uh, uh, before I turn it over to uh, to Peter, um, it, it strikes me as a as a as an uh, an obstruction of democratic process on the part of the mayor uh, to take a um, a veto proof. Uh, majority, a, 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 
bill that is passed with a veto-proof majority, an, an, an overwhelming majority, uh, and to um, not veto it. Because if he had vetoed it, then it would have been up for public debate and we could have really examined all of this. And from, uh, from my perspective, that, that is an affront to uh, uh, democratic process, open debate. So um, as part of our legislative process, uh, the administration can either sign a bill, veto a bill, or let it become law without the mayor's signature. Now, in order to override a veto, well, to pass a bill with 17 members of council, you need to have nine votes, you know, a simple majority. But if the mayor chooses to veto a bill, then you need a higher majority, which is 12 votes to override a veto. And generally, when there is a veto, there's a message with that veto stating why the mayor does not support a bill. And then, as you stated, Susan, that would give us opportunity to have a debate on overriding the veto based on the things that are in the veto message and have a conversation regarding some of the concerns um, that were raised um, by the mayor and saying, I can't support this legislation. Unfortunately, that did not occur. Um, I even sent a letter um, on June 3rd as we were going through the getting to the finer details of the budget process stating my goal once again to uh, have uh, this new authority having board appointments and have financing for it. I was pushing and advocating to my colleagues to do that as part of the budget process. Um, you know, we heard that the administration had some concerns. Um, I wish those concerns were allocated in a video message. And I was told I were receiving a letter in response to my letter from June 3rd um, regarding the administration's concerns. Um, after having another conversation with council colleagues, and I still stated I had not received any type uh, of letter, that's when um, the administration did send a letter on June um, 22nd of this year as we're getting ready to um, wrap the budget process up. And you know, some of the things that were in the letter are typical things you would see in a uh, veto message, and we could have had a real conversation debate, uh, and the administration could have put those issues forward in a more public way, so we could have had that debate and had a back and forth. I mean, I think from my perspective, I'm not mad or angry about um, a, a the position the administration took uh, as a former banker and as a lender. I just have a different experience having done lending, have, having been a small business lender, about some of the things I've seen uh, in our city and needed. And we could have had that conversation. We could have engaged in that conversation um, in a public way, um, but unfortunately we did not. And so now we're at this point where we are trying to continue to move um, this idea forward, just like people in other parts of the country are trying to move the idea uh, for public forward, public banking forward in their jurisdiction. And we will persist with you. Uh, Peter, do we have questions coming from your end or from the from the chat? Uh, yes, uh, Derek, uh, the mayor has refused to appoint the board of directors for the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority, uh, but he hasn't really spoken to these people or addressed this in any way. Can you say something about who has stepped forward? Um, are they qualified? Uh, do they represent the stakeholders? Um, uh, is there any reason that that the mayor would reject uh, the the people who have stepped forward without compensation uh, with the recommendations of city council? Uh, well, I can't speak for um, why the administration made that decision. Uh, you know, we were trying to work with the administration to create a a website um, so that way people could apply through philo.gov. Um, but we weren't hearing back from the administration. And so then we created uh, a website through the city council, uh, to the khlcouncil.com website to receive uh, applications for those who are interested based on the criteria in the legislation. And so um, now the deadline passed, which was June 30th, uh, we'll review that information of those applicants and um, provide that information to the administration. Um, once again, still showing our willingness to 
work with the administration regarding this very uh, important issue. And uh, hopefully there'll be a uh, difference of opinion going forward. But I always, I'm always open to conversation, dialogue, uh, regardless of people's perspectives. Um, people can always change their mind. And I'm always looking forward to um, dialogue so we can move forward. So uh, if I understand correctly, the law is on the books now. It is the, the law that's been passed by council and the mayor allowed it to, to come into um, existence. Uh, but do we need to convince Mayor Kenny to change his mind? Uh, do we need a new mayor? Um, is there, are there avenues, uh, legal avenues uh, for city council or for private, private citizens to bring lawsuit? Um, well, that's litigation. I'm going to be reviewing what is, um, you know, the methodology of doing that. Um, there's been situations where city council and administration with past administrations have had um, legal disagreements, um, but I would rather not get to that point and come to some type of compromise, um, but we'll be doing some research to see what other avenues are available um, for us as we try to move forward on this issue. So uh, in the, the response that the, the mayor gave you on June 22nd, um, he seemed to think that, or the, I think his primary uh, reasoning was that the financial authority would be redundant, that there were already uh, entities in existence that uh, met the needs of the city. Um, I would take issue with that, but uh, some of the things that he seems to not understand are different in terms of what the mandate is and the aspirations are uh, on one hand to become a master uh, CDFI that would support the other CDFIs in the community. And the other thing of course is that the intention of the financial authority is to pave the way and be a precursor for a municipal bank. Um, it, these are issues that don't seem to have crossed his mind or have gotten into the conversation? Is there any indication from any of the private conversations you've had or uh, anything else that that the, the mayor understands what the financial authority intends to do? Well, you know, I can't speak for the administration, uh, but the idea that was provided in the letter said that, you know, PIDC can provide guarantees um, to disadvantaged businesses. But um, that's actually creating more risk for PIDC to provide both a loan and a guarantee. That's not really um, sound lending policy because you're now creating more risk for an entity if they're going to provide both the loan and the guarantee to that same entity. Um, that's why in other industries like insurance, you have your insurance policy, you also have reinsurance, but you don't have reinsurance for the same underwriter that provide the initial insurance policy because the goal is to spread the risk. And the idea for this new entity is to do just that, to create a vehicle to provide some additional uh, assistance to disadvantaged businesses that traditionally have not been getting this type of uh, credit vehicle or this type of instrument to really help them grow as a, a small business to create more jobs and to move uh, our city forward. Uh, and that's why we're trying to not be in competition uh, with traditional CDFIs or you know, for this idea with PIDC or other entities. We're trying to create a entity that's gonna fill a void that's not being met. Because if you talk to a number of businesses, small businesses in particular, especially those in the African-American and the Latin communities, they will say that access to credit is one of the number one issues that stops them from growing. And their inability to grow stop their ability to create more jobs and their inability to create more jobs creates us, keeps us at a 25% poverty rate that we have as a city and also stops those same businesses from providing jobs that could create some of the opportunities to reduce some of the, the violence we have in our city. So the, the mayor's conception uh, seems to be very narrow in terms of loan guarantees, but there are other ways in which the financial authority could uh, nurture the local financial uh, ecosystem, uh, and not just with loan guarantees, but 
other forms of credit enhancement and, and securitization and a variety of, of, uh, of things. Um, it, has there been any discussion about any of those other potentials? Right, and, and Peter, that's a good point because it's not just um, guarantees to the businesses we talked about, like disadvantaged businesses or cooperatives or newer industries like in the solar or green collar industry, but some of those same community development financial institutions also could receive a guarantee from uh, the Philadelphia Public Finance Authority because they too have need to grow and get access to more credit themselves. So that's another way that this entity can partner with them. So it's looking at a broader vehicle and opportunity to how we can create a, a stronger financial ecosystem for the city of Philadelphia, uh, for so many entities that are trying to grow. Uh, so it's just being creative. I think one of the challenges um, that we have in our city is that we keep doing the same things over and over and over again. And so when the coalition first came to me about this idea about public bank, was really intriguing because I was a small business lender from Meridian Bank at Broad and Glenwood. And I saw the historical issues of redlining and knew about the concerns about access to credit. So thinking outside the box is something that we should always try to do going forward as a way to move Philadelphia in a better direction. So uh, do you anticipate that the financial authority and the issues that we've been talking about will be major uh, issues under, under discussion in the next mayoral uh, race, uh, and do we have to wait until the next mayor comes into into office to effectuate the legislation, or are there things that we can do now? Well, the legislation has been passed, so it is it is law in the city of Philadelphia, and uh, I would venture that this coalition will continue to be uh, advocating for the creation of the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority going forward. Uh, as we're going through these future months. And I would also venture in the conversation with the, those who decide to run for mayor uh, in 2023. I would, uh, won't, can't speak for the coalition, but I would venture that this be one of the topics that come up in their conversations with those who are looking to lead the city of Philadelphia in the future. And that I can assure you uh, will definitely be so. So thank you, council member, for once again returning to us. And thank you, everyone, for, for uh, coming. And uh, please put your email in the chat if you don't already or not already on our email list. Uh, we will be back on August 2nd. Um, so thanks, everybody. And blessings all around. Persistence will pay. Thank you all. <laughs>